Hey, beautiful friends. Welcome back to another episode of the Robin Graham Show. Can you prove it? Are you asking prove what? Well, you have to prove your worth. You have to prove that you're worth the price that you're asking. You have to prove that you're going to provide the value that you say you're going to provide. You have to prove that what you're saying is truthful and that if someone invests in you, they're going to get exactly what you claimed they were going to get. How good are you at that? Oh, I bet I've got you thinking, don't I? Well, guess what? Today we have a very special guest and she is the author of Prove It. And we are going to talk specifically about the five types of claims that you can make to prove your worth, to prove your business is the business that you are the one that people should hire. And we're also going to talk about the types of stories that you can tell to make sure that your brand is represented exactly the way you want it to be represented, but in a way that's going to connect with your audience and convert them to paying customers. Without further ado, Melanie Diesel, welcome to The Robin Graham Show. Thanks for having me. Excited to chat. Yeah, me too. So before we dive into the to the nitty gritty of take, making claims on our business, yeah. can you tell me a little or tell the listeners a little bit about mm -hmm. your background and what brought you to this point in your journey? Yeah. So how I ended up at this intersection of sort of uh, marketing, but also a little bit of psychology, a little bit of journalism. Uh, it, it's really been a winding path for me. So I've always been focused on learning other people's stories. So I started out in journalism where I would really focus on, on uncovering these interesting stories and trying to teach that to others. And what I found is that that same kind of skill set was also really helpful in a marketing context that we're trying to understand what our consumers want, what our customers want, what our clients want, and translate those stories, those success stories into content that's going to educate our ideal audience. So it's been a winding path, but I spent some time at the New York Times where I helped build out their brand storytelling team, doing a lot of the type of work that we're talking about today, creating content that, that sort of proves your business case. Uh, I spent some time at Time Incorporated, where I worked as director of creative strategy across their 35 U.S. magazines. So very similar work, right, where I'm trying to help our brands and, and advertisers communicate with the audience in a way that's going to really effectively communicate their brand message through content, not just through squares and rectangles, as I like to call our, our advertising counterparts, right? Uh, all mm -hmm. equally valuable, uh, equally useful, but different strategic goals. Um, and then for the last almost 10 years, I've been out on my own, really focused on on education. So spending a lot of time doing workshops, doing trainings, uh, you know, corporate seminars, speaking at conferences and, and writing books as well, so that I can try to share a lot of this knowledge and experience from that world with folks who are trying to, to build their own case for their audience, trying to position their own brand as something that can be trusted uh, and trying to hopefully tell stories that are really going to connect with people in, in otherwise very busy, noisy content world. Mm, I love that. And since, you know, most of the people listening to the show are in the online space and it is noisy, I like to say the sea of online noise, and we can get inundated with what we see and hear and how do we truly discern and decipher what is right and what is the best for us. So I love that you're doing this. And I love that you said, prove your business claim, because that's what we're going to talk about today. But I love, yeah. I just think that sounds so empowering, really. And listeners, I want to emphasize, I'm going to link in the show notes an episode to Brenna McGowan's interview with me when she talked about her PACE method, because this is just another example of proving your worth, proving the value that you're going to provide and proving that you are the best person. And we talk a lot about um, storytelling on the show, and I can link other episodes for that as well. So you guys can go down this whole entire rabbit hole of learning but when we talk about that, it really is important to differentiate yourself and to tell your story in a way that's going to resonate with your soulmate clients. Because at the end of the day, if you aren't resonating with them, they aren't going to be clear that you are the one they should hire. So how can we prove that? Well, Melanie has five types of claims that she's going to share with us today so that you can start looking at how you're representing yourself and how you're making those claims and putting your stake in the ground that you are the one to be hired. So Melanie, let's start with those five claims. 
Absolutely. So I'll run through the five so we know what we're getting into, and then we can spend more time talking about each because there's so many nuances to each of them and, and different ones will resonate with you depending on your type of business. So overall, the five things that we're often trying to prove to our customers, to our audience, our prospects, whoever those folks are for you, are convenience. We're trying to prove that we're convenient, easy to work with, fast, compatible. We're trying to prove comparability. So we're measuring ourselves or they are measuring us up against other solutions, other competition, or against the possibility of doing nothing at all, not, not even solving this problem. Uh, we're trying to prove commitment. So we want them to understand that we're dedicated to either a cause, dedicated to them, dedicated to our employees, whatever value system we have that is tied to our business. We're trying to prove connection. Like we actually know our customers. We care deeply about your outcomes. We're going to be there for you. Uh, the kind of thing you see a lot in like insurance, for example, right? Like we're on your side or we're like a good neighbor. Uh, and then proving competence is sort of the last one. And it's last, not because it's least important, but because it kind of underpins everything else. At the end of the day, we want our customers to know that we're going to do what we say we do. We deliver the results we say we deliver. So those five, convenience, comparability, commitment, connection, and competence are probably the five main types of claims that you're making or should be making in some form to your audience throughout all the content and communications that you have. So I loved in the book because you gave very specific examples of each one yeah. and you really broke it down using just everyday examples. And so, and you even gave, like you just mentioned the insurance example and yeah. you even gave little tidbits of, you know, here's how so-and-so is making this claim. So mm -hmm. can you, can we just go through the five and sure. break down some examples so that the listeners can take that and then implement. I mean, hopefully everyone goes out and buys your book and I will put the link to the book in the show notes because listeners, yeah. I really do think that there's a lot of value here. If you're interested in furthering this information or your knowledge around this information, but for start, let for starts, let's go ahead and um, starters, I should say, let's go <laughs> ahead and, and dive into number one, convenience. Yeah. So I want to stress that the examples I'm pulling here are going to be mostly like taglines or, or mottos from these companies, because that's what we remember mostly. But these kinds of claims come in the form of mottos, as well as email copy, website copy, social media posts. So look for them everywhere. I'm just using mottos because that's probably the thing most of us remember. I imagine we haven't all spent as much time scrutinizing bread websites as I have. So uh, convenience is one that often comes into like affordability. So a company like Payless or Dollar Tree, like their promise of affordability of convenience is right in the name. Um, but there's also companies that are talking about speed or how easy they are to use. So uh, Visa has their famous where everywhere you want to be, right? So they're proving that, you know, they're saying, hey, if, if you're looking for a card that's going to be accepted everywhere you go, then this is the convenient option. Visa is everywhere you want to be. So those kinds of claims, uh, yeah, speed is another one. So remember Domino's used to have their like 30 minutes or less, or it's free. Um, they don't actually have that anymore. So it's not their current one. I don't want to, don't want to get them on the hook for 30 minute delivery if that's not what they're doing now. But uh, <laughs> another good example of like, they're saying, we know you have a lot of options to order your pizza from. There's a lot of folks who deliver, but if you're looking for convenience, if you're looking for speed, that's something we can deliver. I love that. Okay. Yeah. And then com comparability. Yeah. So comparability is, this is really an interesting one because it it's often talking about contrast to, again, either some other competitor or just like not solving, not addressing the issue at all. Like you're not going to make a purchase or, or engage a service. So we see claims in this area around like quality. Um, so you might have, um, let's see. So uh, Energizer batteries is a good one, right? It just keeps going and going and going. So they're sort of not only saying like, is our product good, but those other batteries are going to run out, but we're going to keep on going. Uh, Timex watches had their famous slogan where they would say, takes a licking and keeps on ticking, right? So they were telling like, <laughs> this is this is what's out there. Um, or how about Gillette? Gillette razors is the best a man can get, right? So they're pointing out like, yes, there are a lot of razor companies. Yes, we all have three or five or however many blades we're up to these days. Uh, but if you're looking for the best, if you're looking for what's better than the other options out there, Gillette is the best a man can get. So mm -hmm. Could be comparing again, like the longevity of the product, the durability, the the quality, really just some sort of claim around what's out there and how you measure up to that competition. 
Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, as you're talking, Melanie, it's, it's bringing to mind, and I'm going to link this in the show notes too, because I did an episode, I don't know when, a while ago, um, the entire blog post too, on differentiation. And mm -hmm. these are like, you're basically breaking down how we differentiate ourselves and speed, quality, all of these things are, are part of that. In addition to, you know, the other things like pricing, um, you know, location, yeah. all of that, but okay. So the third one is commitment. So commitment is the one that probably comes uh, least often in the form of a slogan. It's more often in sort of your values, right? So commitment is something like if you're looking at a company like Patagonia, they talk very much in all of their marketing and all of their copy about their commitment to the environment and about how, you know, they're using ethical practices, they're using green methods, they're engaged in recycling, they're giving back to all these different causes. Um, this is the kind of thing you see during various months throughout the year when we have like it's breast cancer awareness month. And so, you know, we're committed to donating to these causes or it's black history month and we're committed to the cause of equal pay or or whatever the case may be, we see a, a value commitment being expressed in some kind of way. Uh, the reason that this is on the list, even though it's a little different than some of the others, is it's not always tied directly to the product, right? If we're talking about how we give back or like our processes, uh, but this is one of the key drivers of purchasing decisions, especially in younger generations. So they are very committed to, and I mean, we see this all over the place. People want to buy from companies that they feel are values aligned, that believe in the same things they do or support the same causes, or at the very least, don't support the opposite of their values, right? So commitment, your commitment claims about what's important to you. It's very important that you're being open, honest, and really proving your actual commitment to these things. Because since this is so tied to identity, what we see is that if someone thinks that you are, for example, uh, you know, a, a pro environment, a green, low carbon footprint, whatever the case may be company, they're buying from you because that's part of who they are. And that's what they want to do in the world. If they discover that that was a lie or it was exaggerated or, you know, that there's some something untoward happening there, it feels like a personal betrayal more than just like a product disappointment because it is so closely tied to identity. So if you are making values-based claims around who you are as a company, about who you employ, about how you operate, you want to make absolutely sure that you're providing enough information for them to feel secure, that you really are committed to these values and causes that you say you are. I love that. And we talk a lot about values and aligning because the, the fact is, if you're not aligned with your values, then you're not going to be fulfilled or happy or satisfied right. and you're not going to be able to provide good customer service. So the more you align yourself with your core values and then share that people are going to understand that, oh yeah, I am aligned with this person. This is the person that I want to work with. And I can tell we're not going to get frustrated because we are so aligned. Yeah. Right. I love that. Yeah. Okay. And then connection, right. Is the fourth yeah. one. So connection is like the more human side of this, right? And this is especially true if you're working at any sort of service-based business, if you're providing coaching or consulting or, you know, training of some kind where it's really a human connection. This is where you have the sort of, you're a name, not a number is sort of the, the overarching theme of this, right? So uh, Olive Garden, when you're here, your family, um, that's sort of saying like, yes, you're going to go to these other restaurants and they're going to give you good service, sure, but we're going to try to treat you like family. Um, I tell a story in the book about um, a, a car saleswoman that my family has worked with for many, many years. And that sh the, the woman, Kathy, who sold my mom this car starting back in like 1997 and, and through to the present day, just has such a deep connection with our family. It's not just a transaction. She knows birthdays. She knows, you know, she congratulated my mom on becoming a grandma when I had a kid. Like she's really in, you know, connected to us in a deep human way that makes it such a different experience than just buying, buying something, you know, and not hearing from mm -hmm. that sales professional again. So claims around human connection are about usually your, your depth of understanding or depth of relationship with your customers, uh, but also could be your connection to your local community too. It depends on your type of business. You know, we see this a lot. Uh, the best uh, like in real life connection example that many of us can relate to is going into a local restaurant and seeing the sponsorship of like a local soccer team or a baseball team, right? Uh, on the wall, they're proud. They're like, you know, we're not just a chain here. Like we know these kids and we celebrate their wins and we're part of this, we're an integral part of this community. So connection is your way of saying like, 
these are the people that I align myself with. These are the people that I care deeply about. And again, especially for a service-based business, this is like absolutely key thing you want to be putting forward in your messaging. Mm -hmm. I love that. And it's really important to like for coaches, um, it, you know, if you want to work with someone or have someone hire you, it's really important to show like how you're going to be involved in their life and their business. Like, are you just going to say, yeah. okay, go do this. Or are you going to be part of their team? Are they mm -hmm. going to have you in their back pocket? How accessible are you? What is your commitment yes. and to, to continuing that commitment within their organization too, not just, mm -hmm. okay, I'm here for you. Sign the check, you know, pay yes. me, let's, let's move on. But how can we build that connection so that they feel you're never going to desert them. You're always going to be there to support them. Yeah. yeah and that, like that, that connection is especially important too. If you notice, or if you, you take stock after this, and then you notice that referrals or word of mouth is a really big part of your business, then connection is something you want to be leaning into even more talking about the stories of the customers who've been with you for a long time, or, you know, the, the deep transformation that you still go to the, you know, you're still selling a celebrating birthdays, mm -hmm. Uh, of a customer years after they no longer work with you even, right? Like just showing that mm -hmm. there's that depth of connection uh, because that's that's really what drives a lot of, of loyalty, of advocacy, word of mouth and referrals. So if that's a big part of your business, then put a little star next to connection and make sure that's something you're paying extra attention to. Yeah, I love that. And then competence. Competence. So again, competence is, is sort of like the catch all for we're good at what we do. Um, and the way that this shows up is going to be different depending on what it is that you're good at, right? Again, service versus versus product, it could be a little bit different. It may feel similar to comparability in a lot of ways, right? If we're saying we're the best, then obviously we have to be good to begin with. Um, but this often has to do with legacy as well. So if you've been doing something for a long time or your company has been doing something for a long time, that's a good marker of competence, right? So we see like, you know, since 1984 or, you know, whatever sort of uh, year-based tagline we see on companies is, is a way to signal that. Like we've been at this for a while. We know our stuff. We've been doing this. Um, you can signal competence in other ways too, by talking about awards that you've won, by talking about rankings that you appear in. So, you know, I'm one of the 25 uh, top professionals to follow in such and such industry, or, you know, I was in the top 10, you know, whatever ranking that may have come out in your space. Uh, these are all ways to signal sort of third party credibility to say, you don't have to, you know, sort of take my word for it that I'm good at what I do. Here's some other external markers that show that as well. Uh, you can also use testimonials, especially in, in the space to, to prove out how happy people are with, with what you provide. So competence is, is a general, sort of a general catch-all. I think we're all making competence claims in some way, just by being around and then making a case for our business. Um, but again, depending on what kind of service you're providing or what kind of product you're providing, you may find that competence is, is more important if that's the key deciding point between going with you or going with someone else. Um, a good example here would be like, if I'm looking for a surgeon, uh, probably care more about competence than convenience, right? Like that's going to be uh, a higher priority in that instance. So thinking about what are those key, those key things that your audience is looking for when they're making their purchase decision. And if competence is, is super, super important, then that's one you want to pay more attention to. Yeah, I like that. And it, testimonials, I would think, would come into demonstrating your competence, right? A hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so in the book, I talk about all different kinds of content you can use to kind of prove out all these kinds of claims. And truthfully, there's a way to make testimonials work for every single one of these types of claims. You know, you can have a testimonial that talks about how convenient it was to work with you and how, you know, you answered the phone late at night to help them with an emergency, right? Or about how they worked with someone else before, but now they've worked with you and comparably it's such a better experience, right? So you can kind of find the testimonials that speak to each of these different types of business claims. Uh, if you have the liberty of having lots of them or uh, feel inspired to start collecting more. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we kind of touched on, you know, what type of content to, to tell your story or what stories to tell when we talked about testimonials, but what are some other ways, some other stories that we should look to tell to, to really connect with our audience and, and convert them? Yeah. So in, in the book, I talk about three different categories. So I'll give like an overview here. So hopefully you have enough tools in your tool belt to start using all of them in some capacity. 
the first one is going to be, uh, you know, what I would say is your corroboration. So thinking, putting on your like lawyer hat, your CSI, uh, whatever, whatever uh, acronym show of choice you have. Uh, the the corroborating evidence is finding other people to say what you would normally say. Um, so corroborating content is anytime you're saying, don't take my word for it, take theirs. So testimonials fall into this category, uh, customer success stories, case studies, uh, bringing in experts, right? Expert people who may not even be your clients, but whether it's a scientific study that says this is the right course of action, or it's sort of aggregate in, uh, industry data that says this is where things are going, or this is the right way to solve this problem, looking to see, do I have data or people that can kind of back up what I'm saying and give that added confidence to the audience that it's not just me, you know, making things up here, that there's, there's other people who can vouch for what I'm saying. So uh, corroborating content is really great because you can sprinkle it in everything that you do. You know, if you're creating a blog post, find a way to bring an expert in or find a way to bring a customer quote in. If you're going to do something on social, well, you know, could you quote a stat from a relevant study or, or some research that's out there? So you can kind of sprinkle corroboration like seasoning on all of the content that you're creating. Um, Even also, a book review, right? Oh, yeah. Like 100%. Yeah. 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 yeah so uh, definitely. Yeah. It's funny because as a podcast host, this is another example because mm -hmm. there are certain things that I've said for years. And now when I have guests on, it's like they're saying what I've been saying and for me, it's like, oh, dang, I was right all along, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. a boost of confidence in yourself, but it's also proving to your audience that, right. oh, she's not the only one that thinks or says this, this is actually right. like a standard in the industry or, or whatever. Yeah. Well, I mean, I like to make the joke too. I, I connect a lot of things back to like family and, you know, there's always that joke that like, when you tell your kids something, they're like, yeah, sure. Whatever mom. And then, you know, someone at school or a teacher or another kid or another parent says it and they're like, oh, okay, I guess that's for real. So you can kind of apply the same logic here. I can tell you that I'm going to deliver these results and I can help you with this problem all I want. But hearing it from someone else just makes it feel like a much safer choice, a much less risky decision to have to trust only your word to make that purchase choice. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, number two is a demonstration. So when we're demonstrating, we're saying you don't have to take my word for it or anyone's word for the corroboration. We're actually going to show it to you yourself. Um, show being uh, sort of general here could be that you're hearing it or tasting it or smelling it or whatever. But, um, you know, we're going to let you experience the truth of the claim itself. So I like to think of this as like the infomercial uh, category of proof. And I know that sounds a little crazy, but bear with me. Um, anytime you watch an infomercial, they don't just tell you this product absorbs five times more water. They show you that product next to a competition. They dunk them both in the water and you get to see for yourself that this does what it says. So we want to kind of try to take that same approach wherever we can to say, if I'm telling them this, is there a way I could show them instead? Could I make it their own conclusion rather than telling them what to think or what to believe? So that could be if you run a software company or you have some sort of tool that you're selling, can you show a side-by-side -side that says, our product is simple and easy to use? I could tell you that. But I also want to show you, here's the side-by-side -side onboarding experience between our product and a similar product so you could see how easy it is to actually log in and create an account, for example, or how mm -hmm. easy it is to get started. Uh, we see this on, again, on commercials a lot with, you know, like women's beauty products where it's like, you know, oh, it's so hard to hold up your hair dryer and, you know, it hurts your arm. But with this new hook, you know, you can just hang it there and you can see, you know, so you get to like see it yourself. Um, this seems like it might only be for physical products that you can show a side by side, but there are ways to do this if you're selling an intangible service as well. So if you are, again, you're doing coaching and you're talking about, uh, this is how available I am, then maybe you show your hours and say, you know, most people are only available nine to five. Here's when I'm available to answer your calls or your questions. Or, you know, people say that they'll get back to you fast. Well, here's here's my average response time. And you could see that number here. Um, you know, I can tell you that I've worked with lots of great brands. Well, here are some of the actual brands. Here are the logos of who I've worked with. So you're again, you're just finding ways to show it instead of just say it. And that quality of demonstration can go a really long way toward earning that trust because they feel like it's their decision and not yours. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Number three is education, education. So 
Educational content is super important in, in a couple different instances. So I'll point those out just in case it applies to any of you who are here listening. Um, the first one is going to be if you work with people who are engaging your product or service for the first time. So if you something like buying a home or a wedding dress, you know, you're doing wedding planning, like typically when people are working through that product or service, it's often the first time they're doing it. So they have a knowledge gap. You know a lot more about this than they do. And that makes them feel unsure of whether they're making the right decision. So if you're in that sort of like first time buyer, they won't have worked with someone like you or a product like yours before, education is going to be extra important. And the other instance where that's especially true is if your buyer is not your end user. To give a tangible example, if you are selling to the CEO, but it's the engineers who are going to use your product, or it's the salesperson, people who are going to use your product, that buyer may not have the same level of knowledge as the folks sort of on the front lines on the ground who are going to be engaging with that service or that finished product. So you want to make sure you're filling that knowledge gap with educational content. You can do this with uh, what I call it, like informational content, where it's purely like, here's the key terms, here's what you need to know, here's questions to ask, right? You're sort of just giving them information to help them feel more comfortable in that whole process, more comfortable that they can trust you, that they are making the right decisions themselves that they can trust. Uh, but you can also do it with coaching content where you're actually helping them through the process. So this might be like an onboarding guide where you're saying, oh, I know it might be intimidating. It sounds like a lot of work to set up, but we've got a comprehensive onboarding guide that's going to walk you through step by step. So now you're educating them on that process, but in the process, you're also increasing their trust that not only are you going to be able to help, but they're going to be able to accept that help and receive that transformation you're trying to deliver. So informational is just like, here's some facts. I brought these for you. Please enjoy. Uh, and then the coaching content is more like, let me take your hand and walk you through this. Uh, and all of that goes a long way toward helping everyone involved feel more confident that this is going to move in the right direction. This is a good match between customer, uh, you know, buyer and seller, uh, and that you guys are going to have a, a great relationship moving toward the the end goals that you're setting for yourselves. Mm, I love that. And it's almost like you're meeting them right where they are. You're, you're mm -hmm. telling them what they need to hear. And this yeah. is where knowing your audience's pain points is so important because now Absolutely. you can educate them on how you can solve that problem for them. So we talk a lot about that on the show, just from that perspective of if, if there's something you can do, you have to communicate it. Like nobody's mm -hmm. going to find you if you're not putting know. yourself out there, yeah. making these claims and then telling the stories around them. Okay, yeah. Melanie, this has been so fabulous. <laughs> like we just really plowed through a lot of information in a very short period of time. We definitely this is, did. Like, <laughs> so succinct and so valuable. Um, how can the listeners connect with you, learn more about you, even hire you or, or work with you? Yeah, so um, I'm sure you'll share the link in the show notes. My website is just my name. So Melanie Diesel. Uh, dot com. Um, I'm also very search optimized. So if you look for me on your, your network of choice, Twitter, LinkedIn threads nowadays, uh, you'll find me searching Melanie Diesel. So it's just Melanie D-E-Z-I-E-L and you'll find me wherever you look. Uh, you can find Prove It and my other book, The Content Fuel Framework on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, bookshop.org, um, or even in your local Barnes and Noble store. So would love to connect with you all, see what stories you're telling and, and see how we can kind of create even stronger stories together. Yeah, absolutely. So listeners, I want to encourage you, reach out to Melanie, connect with her and show her a little bit of support because she really gave us a ton of value today. Follow her on the new threads or Instagram <laughs> or LinkedIn. I know I'm connected with you on LinkedIn yeah, um, because that's my platform of choice. But you guys, this was such valuable information. And I encourage you to, hopefully you took notes and if not, you can go mm -hmm. back and listen and take notes again or buy the book and your book <laughs> will probably end up looking like my book with a ton of notes <laughs> and ideas and everything else. But I encourage you to connect with her and, and really take heart to what she suggested we do today, because this is really incredibly valuable information. I will have all the links to the other shows in the show notes. So you can easily access all of that. And there will be a plethora of those. So be sure and go check that mm -hmm. out. But if you found this information helpful and really enjoyed this conversation, please leave us a rating and review because that is how more listeners are going to find this. And honestly, we need to create this ripple effect of good in the world. And this is how we're going to do it is by helping more and more businesses succeed. So please, please do me a solid and leave a rating and review, subscribe to the show. So you never subscribe to the show. So you never miss an episode and 
Again, Melanie, thank you so much for being here and listeners have a fabulous week and I'll see you next time.